It is a pleasure for me to introduce Patrick Armstrong, currently at the University of Western Australia. Patrick, why don't you tell us something about your birthplace and uh, um, early childhood, late childhood? I was uh, born in Yorkshire and uh, I'm happy to claim to be a Yorkshireman in the company of other such illustrious men, but I moved from there when I was 18 months old and spent a good deal of my childhood in, in Cambridge, where my father was a Church of England vicar. He was quite an important influence on me. He liked to call himself the last of the parson naturalists following the line established by Ray and Gilbert White and uh, many very important figures in the development of English and indeed European science. We lived on the uh, outskirts of the city of Cambridge, not uh, far from the university departments and colleges, so I was brought up very much in an environment where academic values were important, but even more important was the enormous garden that uh, English vicarages had then and to some extent st uh, still have, uh, where it was not a a very well organized garden from the gardener's point of view, but there were plants and animals, it was rather wild, and I received uh, my early experience of, of natural history and interest in the environment there uh, under the tutelage of <coughs> my father who developed in me a, an interest in the countryside and in animals and plants. He, he was a, an ornithologist. He wrote a number of books about birds as well as a number of uh, theological works. Uh, I went to school in Cambridge, but I didn't do my university training there. I went north uh, to Durham, uh, University of Durham, and studied particularly under Professor Ian Simmons, who was, I think I'm right in saying, the first biogeographer appointed to the Department of Geography in Durham. And uh, he was an Im important influence on me. He uh, developed the rather unsystematic interest in natural history and plants and animals and the environment that I gained in, in childhood. In, in Cambridge and in the East Anglian countryside into something a little bit more organized. You, you definitely developed a keen interest in biogeography. Would you like to expand a little bit on its, on, on its growth, its emergence and growth, and uh, whether you feel satisfied with what it has accomplished to date? I, I think the, the short answer to your last question is yes, I do feel quite satisfied with what it's uh, accomplished. It's got a number of different strands, and uh, I've, I've got an interest in all of them. Uh, the uh, distribution of plants and animals throughout the world, the uh, phenomenon of disjunct distributions, why some distributions are broken and uh, some continuous. Uh, that's uh, an important theme. Uh, island biogeography is to some extent linked to this. This has been an important theme in biogeographical thinking recently. Uh, the subject overlaps with ecology, uh, of course, and I think one of the most interesting and important contributions that uh, biogeography can make, uh, perhaps as a, uh, something of a, a link uh, subdiscipline between human and physical geography, is uh, through e ecosystem theory. 
the application of ecosystem ideas, uh, ideas of nutrient circulation, uh, energy flow, the uh, food web concept and so on, to uh, systems in which man is an important component. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to, to look at agriculture and forestry in, uh, in ecological terms and consider a, a, a wheat field or a conifer plantation as an ecosystem in the same way that um, even a, a city come to that, in the same way that uh, e ecologists have more traditionally examined such systems as coral reefs or rainforests or tundra. Uh, so that I think would be uh, my suggestion for uh, of one of the most important contributions of biogeography. Now, your own work has flowered into a rather keen study uh, on certain aspects of Darwin as your presentation here at the uh, symposium in Geneva of the International Geographical Union. You gave a very excellent presentation the other day. Um, could you tell us about your introduction to Darwin and, uh, and, and, and where, where the study is going? Uh, I can, I can cer certainly say something about how I came to be uh, interested in Darwin, which is, is really quite personal. It again uh, goes back to my childhood in Cambridge. I remember when I was a lad of about eight, I uh, used to see uh, Gwen Raverat, one of uh, Charles Darwin's brilliant grandchildren, who was already by then a very elderly lady, and I regularly used to, to see her uh, along the backs of the colleges, along the River Cam, and uh, around Newnham, where uh, I lived, uh, painting. She, she was a very accomplished artist, and I, I remember uh, watching with interest how the, the, the scene before her developed on her easel. And, uh, she was uh, pointed out to me as Charles Darwin's granddaughter, and uh, I had a, an interest in, in the brilliant Darwin family, more or less from that time. Uh, some years later, uh, when I was uh, uh, teaching at the College of Arts and Technology in Cambridge, I had, uh, I, I think it was Charles Darwin's great, great, great grandchild in front of me for a short time, and so the, the link was continued there. And I suppose the, the next uh, development, of a uh, stage in the development of my interest in Darwin was when, uh, on the death of my father, who I've uh, mentioned to you uh, a few years ago, I inherited a substantial part of his library and in that was a, a copy of uh, one of the editions of Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. And there was one of my uh, father's annotations in it. There were very few annotations, uh, but he had written something on, on one of the, the front pages. Uh, uh, Western Australia, emu dance, page so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. And uh, I, I followed this up. I looked up and saw what uh, Charles Darwin had to say about uh, Western Australia, where I was by then living, and uh, became extremely interested in uh, what Darwin had to say about Western Australia in particular and, and uh, Australia as a whole. Uh, partly because he was so critical of it. There are many aspects of uh, Australian life, the convict system, for example, uh, the uh, certain aspects of the bleakness of the Australian environment that he didn't like at all. Uh, but, but yet he was fascinated by it, uh, with its uh, unique assemblage of plants and animals. Uh, it was quite different 
from uh, anything else that he had uh, he had encountered in his uh, four and a half years, as it was by then, of voyaging around the world in uh, HMS Beagle. Uh, so I developed uh, an interest in uh, Charles Darwin's stay in Australia, and I, at a slightly later time, was able to spend some months back in Cambridge during a sabbatical from the University of Western Australia, uh, going through uh, Darwin's diaries and notes, and really getting into his mind a bit about what he thought about Australia and how it influenced his, uh, his development. And uh, a logical extension of that is uh, a consideration of how uh, Darwin's thought has influenced the subject of geography. Um, he, he never thought of himself as a geographer at all. He was a, uh, a naturalist, uh, first and last. Uh, but he was uh, profoundly influenced by the uh, great ge uh, geographer Alexander von Humboldt, uh, and also by Lyell, who was a geologist, but at that time I think we must think of geolo geology and physical geography as uh, very much together. And uh, he had uh, both these uh, works by both these, these two uh, luminaries uh, with him in his uh, little cabin on the Beagle, and often uh, Humboldt's personal narrative uh, describing his own voyage to South America and uh, Lyell's principles of geology must have been on the, the, the chart room table in front of Darwin together. And uh, the, the influence of these two books as the world unfolded round him as he voyaged in the Beagle uh, were, were very, very, very in, important in, in Darwin's development and in his turn uh, his emphasis on, uh, on gradualism, not just evolution through natural selection, important though that was, but his ideas on coral islands, his uh, uh, application of the notion of gradualism to uh, to psychology, to study he made of the effect of earthworms on the soil. Uh, this, this doctrine of gradualism that uh, permeates a great deal of Darwin's work has in its turn had a, had a tremendous effect on the development of geography uh, in the, the years that followed. Uh, an, another aspect, if I can uh, follow it a little bit further, uh, he was immensely interested in the distributions of plants and animals, a, uh, an aspect that now forms, falls clearly within the bailiwick of geography, uh, because he, he saw uh, the, uh, the, the study of distributions part, partly as evidence for evolution, and part, partly he uh, reasoned that long-distance dispersal was really uh, an idea that was closely associated with evolution. If uh, plants and animals had not been uh, independently uh, created uh, and just plonked down in, in some uh, disconnected pattern, uh, if organisms had evolved from uh, a single or a, a few simple forms, uh, then it followed that if we, we see today a disjunct distribution, uh, an organism is found in two widely separated parts of the world, then it follows that at some time in the past, the, the ancestors of the or organism must have gone from, from one place to another. And, he was very interested, he attached great importance to uh, long distance dispersal. And in looking at his notes and reading his, his letters, uh, we see uh, him uh, paying children to collect lizard's eggs and then floating them on water and seeing what happened. 
and analysing the mud on the feet of birds to see if there were seeds in it and uh, uh, going into some detail as to the actual mechanisms of, of long distance dispersal. This is very much an idea that he saw as associated with the, the notion of evolution. You mentioned to me that uh, you felt possibly that uh, Darwin hadn't been studied perhaps sufficiently with regard to Australia. The impact of Darwin in South America is much mm. better known. I, I, think, uh, I think that's, that's true. He, uh, his, uh, his time in, in South America and of course his uh, epoch-making epoch stay on the Galapagos has been uh, uh, documented in articles, in books, in uh, television programs and films and so on. But uh, his time in Australia, uh, uh, particularly my particular locale, Western Australia, has been uh, very much uh, less documented uh, and yet it was very important to him. Hmm. Now you spent some time in Kent uh, at Down. Yes. Yes, that was an interesting experience. I spent, uh, as I remarked to you uh, a, a couple of years ago, some months working through the, the uh, a small part, of course, of the Darwin archive in Cambridge and examining his, uh, his diaries, his notes, his letters, his lists of specimens and so on, and uh, felt that after many weeks of, of uh, decoding his handwriting and uh, entering to some extent into the way that he thought, that I, I knew him and his family quite well. And uh, after, after this uh, part of the study, I, I went down to Down in, uh, in Kent, which was his, his home for 40 years, which is now conserved uh, more or less in the in the state that it was in his day as a Charles Darwin memorial and it, it really was a very strange almost unreal experience uh, because I, I, I felt that I, I knew him and uh, his family to, to walk into uh, his old study to uh, walk into the sitting room of, of Down House, uh, the effect on me was uh, to, to feel that it was just as though uh, Charles and his uh, wife Emma had uh, gone out to the village for a walk. It, it was really a, a very strange uh, experience. I can't explain mm. it any more mm. than that, but it, it had a, a great effect on me and was uh, important, uh, important in encouraging me to go on with, with this piece of work. And do you have a program for further uh, Darwin research? I think in the immediate future it, it will be very much the same sort of thing uh, uh, that I've been doing recently, uh, looking at the time that Darwin spent in uh, Australia and more generally in the Indo-Pacific area. Uh, and evaluating the effect that it had on him and uh, in turn looking at the effect that uh, Darwin, uh, Darwin's thinking had on development of our, our subject of geography. Well, you've been in Australia now uh, 10 years approximately. That's right. Um, do you have any thoughts, any reflections on... Uh, university life or life in Australia, one tends to think of Australia perhaps being somewhat more isolated than some of the other university countries. Yes, um, I, isolation is a problem. It, it uh, cannot be uh, denied and uh, Western Australia is uh, one of the most isolated universities in the world. Uh, Within the last few years, uh, Murdoch University, also in the city of Perth, uh, has established, but although it doesn't have a, a department of geography. But with that uh, very recent 
uh, development. With that exception, uh, our nearest universities are uh, Adelaide uh, across the Nullarbor Plain in, in uh, South Australia, uh, something like 2,000 miles away, and uh, some of the Asian universities to the north. So uh, isolation is a problem, but uh, I think it would be fair to say that uh, facilities for study leave uh, have been uh, relatively generous uh, compared with uh, some other uh, university countries, as, as you put it. Whether this uh, enlightened situation will continue, one cannot say. but. Uh, th there is the possibility of, of taking study leave after three years in, in Europe or in North America uh, to uh, benefit from new ideas. But I have to say that, yes, it, isolation is a, a small but important problem. Well, it's been very nice talking with you, and uh, I certainly look forward to more of your work on uh, Darwin. Thank you very much, Jeff. I've enjoyed our chat.